السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن والاه We commence in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his entire household, all his companions, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them and bless every single one of us and grant us all goodness. May Allah forgive us this beautiful eve of the month of Ramadan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us acceptance. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala write our names from among those who have been granted freedom from hellfire. Ameen. My brothers and sisters, Surah An-Nur is a surah named after the light. If we look at the surah, we will see that in it there are rules and regulations pertaining to morality, pertaining to adultery, perhaps uh, false accusation, as well as the gaze of a believing male and female. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about how important it is to ensure that your eyes are controlled by yourself as best as you can because of the implications that it has when you wonder or when you begin to look everywhere without any control. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to control our gazes and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us in every single way. That having been said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given a special light, a special nur to the one who lowers his gaze, he or she. And this is a beautiful light that is granted to those who lower their gazes it is a light in the heart that reflects as well on the face. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who have this nur and the light on the day of judgment. Remember my brothers and sisters, when we abstain from prohibition for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is written as a good deed. That's amazing. So to do a good deed, to fulfill salah, to fulfill your zakah, to fulfill your prayers, to recite the Qur'an and so on. Those are good deeds. But even if you were just to abstain from a sin that is accessible to you, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it would be a huge reward. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward us all. One of the most important organs that we have, the tongue. So much so that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, مَن يَضْمَن لِي مَا بَيْنَ لِحْيَيْهِ وَمَا بَيْنَ فَخِذَيْهِ Whoever guarantees me the correct use of that which is between the cheeks, meaning the tongue, and that which is between the thighs, meaning the private parts, I guarantee him a place in paradise. Subhanallah. It sounds nice and easy, doesn't it? The whole life rotates around these two organs. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us use these organs correctly. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who earn paradise. So obviously we are responsible for what we say. If a person accuses another of something, he needs to substantiate that accusation. We are not free to just accuse people without any substantiation, without any witness or evidence. If that is the case, we will be punished. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it clear that the reputation of an individual is sacred. Subhanallah. You are a human being, your life is sacred, your reputation is sacred, your lineage is sacred, your wealth is sacred, your mind is sacred. These are all things that are protected by the Sharia. Sacred meaning they are considered valuable in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nobody can just take your life away, my life or anyone else's life. There needs to be a procedure before that happens if a person is guilty of murder. The court system would then find them guilty and then would penalize them. And remember, if you do not have authority on the land, you cannot just take the law in your own hands. So I cannot just say, look, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala requires that, for example, a fornicator is lashed. So let me start lashing all the people and you make a big announcement for people to come to you and you start lashing them. That is not correct. In fact, it is unacceptable because one of the basic rules and regulations regarding the fulfillment of the penal code in Islam is for you to have authority on land, for you to have that authority over those who perhaps would be uh, penalized. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that deep understanding. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it is forbidden to accuse people of adultery. Totally forbidden. Absolutely unacceptable for anyone to say these two are having an affair. The minute you say that, 
you need to produce four good Muslims as eyewitnesses or you deserve to be lashed 80 lashes in public and you are considered a sinful person you bearing witness for anything in the future will be rejected this is what Surah An-Nur says in the opening verses it is a protection for the females as well as for the males so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says verse number four وَالَّذِينَ يَرْمُونَ الْمُحْصَنَاتِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَأْتُوا بِأَرْبَعَةِ شُهَدَاءِ Those who have falsely accused the chaste women of adultery, they have thrown an accusation in their direction, and they do not come up with four solid eyewitnesses who have witnessed the act, then do you know what Allah says you should do to them? فَجَلِدُوهُمْ ثَمَانِينَ جَلْدَةً وَلَا تَقْبَلُوا لَهُمْ شَهَادَةً أَبَدًا You should lash them 80 lashes and you should never accept their bearing of witness again. And Allah calls them sinful people. My brothers and sisters, let's pause for a moment. How many of us are guilty of saying, Oh, those two are having an affair. And we think it's light. And the news spreads like wildfire. Not only is it rumor, but it is slander. It is wrong. We didn't see anything. Perhaps we might have saw two people walking or talking or two people perhaps chatting, even if they were blushing. It doesn't mean they were having an affair. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. These are dangerous statements that are uttered from the mouths of people. And the worst thing is, Allah says, those people will be punished in this world and the next. Because they have falsely accused someone else. The best thing you can do, remain silent. Keep quiet. Seek forgiveness. Do not mess your tongue, your mouth with an accusation, a rumor, a slander about someone. You don't even know. You don't even have witness. Someone said, look, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I guarantee you these two are having an affair. Astaghfirullah. May Allah forgive us. These are statements that are flying around. Technology has made it simple for slander to be spread. And do you know what? The number of people earning the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is simply increased. Because technology, you have the broadcast facility on your phone whereby a click of the button does not send the message to one person, but to hundreds of thousands. May Allah forgive us. Be very, very careful how you use technology. One small accusation can result in your downfall. Today, we complain about lack of contentment. We complain about this, about that. We complain about so much. We, we are leading lives that are full of disaster. But we don't know, perhaps we have hurt or harmed a friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have falsely accused an innocent person and we are simply being punished. Because the hadith says, مَنْ عَادَ لِي وَلِيًّا فَقَدْ آذَنْتُهُ بِالْحَرْبِ Whoever has hurt or harmed a friend of mine, I've announced war against them. A war that you and I can never win. If Allah declares war against someone, the game is over. That is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the best thing to do, be silent. Use your tongue to remember Allah, to say good words. Have good thoughts of your fellow human beings. Good thoughts. You see two people speaking, for example, you may know they're not supposed to be speaking the way they are speaking, but don't suddenly accuse them of the worst possible thing. You might want to say perhaps there is something wrong. Perhaps the brother is assisting the sister. Perhaps there is some need that was being fulfilled and met. Look at good things. It's called husnul dhan. To have good thoughts for our fellow believers. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. It is reported and it is said that when a person's habits are dirty themselves, they begin to think that everyone else has the same sickness and perhaps has the same habits. But let's realize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has definitely, has definitely kept goodness in thinking good about others. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has as a result of that kept something beautiful. People would also think good about us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So these are verses, introductory verses within the surah. Now, the issue was when you see someone and you have four eyewitnesses, you bring them forth, they need to bear witness. Firstly, they need to be very, very good people who do not miss a prayer, who, are, who do not have a blemish on their slate. And then they will bear witness as to the act itself and the details of it in front of a judge. And they will bear witness separately and their witness must concur. Their evidence must be exactly the same. And then we will take it to the next level. Now, this shows us that obviously it is more a deterrent than anything else. Because it is virtually impossible for four very good Muslims to be witnessing an act of adultery 
and to watch the people and to be able to bear witness later on. Because you and I know that a good Muslim, when we see or when any one of us for that matter, if we were decent enough, if we see something immoral going on, the best thing we would do is look away. Don't you agree? Look away, none of your business. I see people are silent. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. It reminds me of people thinking, perhaps we take our phones out and quickly video it. Astaghfirullah. You know, we saw, I saw a little cartoon some time back of a person and they were trying to depict how we've all become enslaved by the mobile phone such that we don't help the one needing help. They say a person drowning with one hand floating, meaning going up and down the water, and they are saying, help, help, and everyone's just holding on and taking pictures instead of diving in and helping them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. This is the world and this is what we've become. We've become people who, who are enslaved by technology to the degree that we forget what's right and wrong in simple terms. So there was an incident that occurred more than once at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa This is a hadith I'm going to mention. Very, very interesting, but very serious. It's muttafaqun alayh. Hadith of Sahl ibn Sa'd al-Sa'idi radiyallahu an. He says there was a man known as Uwaymir al-Ajlani. Remember that name. Uwaymir al-Ajlani radiyallahu an. So he caught his wife with someone and he didn't know what to do because he just heard that you need to have four eyewitnesses or you will be lashed. So he asked his friend. His friend was Asim ibn Adi radiyallahu an. He says, look, this is what has happened. And what is the ruling regarding a person who doesn't have the witness, but it's their own spouse. And they have seen it with their own eyes. They don't have witnesses. By the time they go out to get the witnesses, everything is over and done. And the person has run away and the story is over. So Asim ibn Adi radiyallahu anhu was asked to ask Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this hadith is muttafaq alayhi. So he goes to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he asks him, O oh Messenger, what if someone sees their own spouse with their own eyes and they don't have witness and they don't know what to do because should they go out and get the witness and, or what should happen? So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't like the question. Obviously, it was a very low question in the sense that, yes, the man wanted to know. But the reality, this is not common of the believing women. It is not common of the believing women. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam delayed in the answer and revelation had come. So when Asim ibn Adi radiallahu anhu went back, he was met by Uwaymir al-Ajlani radiallahu anhu who asked him what happened. He said, I didn't really get an answer. He says, well, I'm going to go to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and I'm going to ask him myself. So he built up the courage. He plucked up the courage and went in the presence of the companions. And he says, O Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if someone has seen their spouse, and they don't have the four witnesses that are required. What should happen? And how should they deal with it? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Allah has revealed verses of the Quran regarding your issue. Subhanallah. So what are these verses? Beautiful verses, verse number six of Surah An-Nur, right at the beginning. Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ يَرْمُونَ أَزْوَاجَهُمْ وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُمْ شُهَدَاءُ إِلَّا أَنفُسُهُمْ those who have accused their own wives and they don't have the four witnesses besides themselves, they are the only witnesses, then they should do the following. Allah says, فَشَهَادَةُ أَحَدِهِمْ أَرْبَعُ شَهَادَاتٍ بِاللَّهِ إِنَّهُ لَمِنَ الصَّادِقِينَ They should bear witness under oath in the presence of obviously the justice system and the other spouse that by the name of Allah, I swear by Allah that I saw the following and what I saw is definitely the truth and I am truthful. So they bear, they bear witness or they take the oath once, they take it twice, they take it thrice, they take it four times. What do they say? Wallahi, I am truthful in what I have said. Each time they bear witness or they swear an oath, it is considered as one witness. So, Awaymir al-Ajlani radiallahu anhu was asked to bring his wife along. He brought his wife along in the presence of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, And he was asked to swear the oath. He swore an oath four times to say, I swear that what I am saying is the truth. I am truthful. And then the fifth time, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam told him, you need to now swear an oath or you need to invoke the curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on you if you are telling a lie. Allah says, 
والخامسة أن لعنة الله عليه إن كان من الكاذبين. He bore witness four times, right? The fifth one is, may the curse of Allah be on me if I'm telling a lie. Now that it happened five times, the punishment is necessary on the female or on the person being accused, but they are given the option, the option of clarifying their name, equating, you know, coming back with another oath that is opposite to the one that was just born by the spouse. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa asks the woman, would you like to plead guilty or would you like to swear four times that he is telling a lie? So she says, I will swear four times that he is telling a lie. So she swore the first time an oath that he was lying. The second time an oath he was lying. The third time and the fourth time. And the fifth time she was asked to say, may the anger of Allah be upon me if he is telling the truth. وَالْخَامِسَةَ أَنَّ غَضَبَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهَا إِن كَانَ مِنَ الصَّادِقِينَ That was the fifth one. May the, may the anger of Allah be upon me if he is telling the truth. So once that happened, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we can no longer punish her. But something very, very serious takes place. As a result of falsely accusing your spouse of adultery or even accusing her if it is not false or saying that she did this automatically, if this has happened officially in the presence of the justice system, it would mean the marriage is dissolved and it is broken and they cannot get together ever again, no matter how hard they try. So you need to be careful. You know, normally people get married, they can dissolve the marriage in one of a few ways. One of them is to get a nullification. One of them is to get a dissolution of that marriage. And one of them is to get a divorce from the spouse. So there are a few ways of dissolving the marriage. And the most serious from amongst them is when you've accused someone officially in the presence of the justice system, the legal system, officially, properly, that means the marriage is over and you can never ever get back together with that spouse. So let's be careful my brothers and sisters before we accuse anyone and before we accuse one another. It's a statement that seems very light on the tongue but the consequences are absolutely severe. Yes, one might ask what if we just said it in passing? If you said it in passing, the wrath of Allah is indeed on its way unless we seek forgiveness. But perhaps it would not result in the breakup of the marriage because it was not officially done. Like I said, and I made it clear, for the marriage to be broken irreparably, it needs to be done officially. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. May He never, ever let that happen to us. Amen. So, this is what happened to Uwaymir al Ajlani radiallahu an. And these were the beautiful verses of this beautiful surah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us a lesson from this. The same had happened according to a narration of Bukhari by Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu to another companion known as Hilal ibn Umayyah radiallahu anhu who also happened to accuse his wife and they also had the same uh, system, they also had the same oaths that were taken and at the same time both of them took the oaths and therefore the woman was not punished because she also took an oath that I didn't do it. So whatever had happened, it was obviously in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah knows best. But at the same time, we have just been taught the legal system here when it comes to the Sharia. Ah. My brothers and sisters, I want to spend a little bit of time with the next story, which is one of the most serious accusations that was ever leveled in history. It was an accusation leveled against Aisha radiallahu anha. The hadith is muttafaq alayh, and it is reported by Aisha radiallahu anha herself. The most pure of all women to exist was Aisha radiallahu anha. She was purified and cleansed. And her innocence was mentioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, in Surah An-Nur, and we happen to read it often. And this is why those who accuse Aisha radiallahu anha of immorality and of evil, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from such statements. They have uttered the greatest blasphemy against Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it is Allah himself who clarified her name and who purified her. So what was the accusation? The hadith says the Prophet ﷺ, when he used to go out on some of his journeys, 
he used to take with him some of his spouses, sometimes one, sometimes more than one. And sometimes he used to draw a lot as to whom he should take. So he would draw a lot. The Aisha radiallahu anha says, on this particular occasion, it was me who was fortunate to be traveling with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa We went for the battle of Banu al-Mustaliq. And on our way back from Banil Mustaliq, the army had stopped and they had paused for a while in one place. And when they were getting ready to leave, I noticed that my necklace was missing. Like we said before, this was not the first time that the necklace of Aisha radiallahu anha went missing. But her necklace went missing and she started hunting for it. And she moved a little bit of a distance. And before she knew it, she had a carrier that would carry her that was covered, known as a hawdaj in the Arabic language. So the, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum would lift up the entire carriage from the top of the camel and put it down. And then the women would actually get down and later on when they wanted to leave, they would lift up that carriage, put it back on top of the, the camel and they would leave. So they lifted the carriage without knowing that she's not in there. And they put it on the camel and they departed. And a, a little while later she came and she noticed the army is gone. So she decided, you know what, let me sit put exactly where I am and I don't want to move because they will realize it at some stage and they will come back. So after some time, she noticed that these people are gone and they are not coming back. But she noticed there was one person who had come and who was also proceeding in a similar direction, a great companion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, who Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam really loved and respected. And his name was Safwan ibn al-Mu'attal radiallahu anhu. And when he came, he noticed something black. This was after the verses of hijab. So he noticed it and he realized there is a person here lying down. And Aisha radiallahu anha says, I had slept and I got up with this noise. And I noticed that this is a man. And I knew him, Safwan ibn al-Mu'attal. And he recognized that this was Aisha. He did not say a single word according to her. He did not say one word. He didn't speak to her. The only thing he did, he offered her help through the sign. And he ensured that she got onto his camel and he happened to continue and carry on. He didn't even ask what went wrong and what happened. Nothing at all. So respectful and so honest. In the meantime, in Medina Munawwara, as the Prophet ﷺ and everybody arrived and people found out that Aisha radiallahu anha is missing, the hypocrites headed by Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, they decided to create a rumor. And this rumor was that Aisha, astaghfirullah, May Allah forbid, may Allah protect us all from messing our tongues with such accusations against innocent people was having an affair. Astaghfirullah. With whom? Oh, with this guy known as Safwan ibn al-Mu'attal. And as they entered Medina Munawwara, you find the nudgings of all the people. You see, there they are. Look, they're coming. And Aisha radiallahu anha was innocent. She didn't even know what was going on. Safwan ibn al-Mu'attal radiallahu anha, he had no clue what was happening. And she went home and, and you know, she didn't hear about any rumor. She didn't know about anything, but the rumor started. And it started spinning. May Allah forgive us. Today, WhatsApp has made it so easy for us to publish rumors and to forward them. Wallahi, my brothers and sisters, the sin of forwarding something dirty is really so, so grave that it will result sometimes in our lives being turned upside down and we don't know why. But weren't you abusing WhatsApp, trying to accuse this one and that one and, you know, slandering and rumor spreading? Wallahi, we need to ask Allah's forgiveness and we need to come back to the straight path and we need to be responsible in the way that we use technology. So Aisha radiallahu anha says that I didn't even know and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he heard the rumor. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu heard the rumor. They knew deep down, this is just a rumor. Because he knew his spouse. But at the same time, it's not easy for someone to clear the name of his own spouse. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knew that at some point, Allah will reveal something. In the meantime, he was silent. He didn't really take sides openly. But... It caused a lot of distress and discomfort. He used to enter and his attitude to Aisha radiallahu anha changed. He hadn't yet told her anything. And she was wondering, why is he being so different? And he used to ask her every time, how is that one? How is that one? How is who? How is, you know, what is this question? Subhanallah. He used to enter again. How is that one? How is who? This question used to hurt Aisha radiallahu anha. She didn't know what to say. What's going on? And the Prophet ﷺ chose not to say any words, nothing. 
So she didn't know. But she was distressed. And one day she went out with a lady known as Ummu Mistah, who was related to her and her father. And as she went out for an errand, Ummu Mistah says, destruction upon Mistah. So Mistah was the son of this lady. And Aisha radiallahu anha says, what do you mean? The man attended the battle of Badr. How can you make that dua against him? And he's your own son. So she says, do you know what he's been saying? She says, no, what has he been saying? So Ummu Mistah decided to tell Aisha radiallahu anha that my son is one of those who's going around spreading a rumor about you and Safwan ibn al-Mu'attal radiallahu anha. She was shocked. She was stunned. She did not know about it prior to that. And she was now fitting in all the pieces of the puzzle. This is why the Prophet ﷺ is asking me this question. And this is why his behavior towards me has changed. So she goes back to the home. She was crying. And the Prophet ﷺ came in. He asks the same question. And she says, Oh Messenger, can I please go back to my parents for a while? Subhanallah. Look at the etiquette we are learning here. I need to discuss this matter with my folks. It's a serious matter. It seems like the best thing for me to do here is to go and meet my mom and my dad and to talk to them about what's going on. So the Prophet ﷺ allows her to go. Now imagine, subhanallah, a lot of people, if someone were to spread rumor about your spouse, I think a lot of people would actually break their marriages there and then without even thinking. May Allah forgive us. I hope that's not the case. Let's never ever believe rumor. If that's the case, it's so easy for someone to break a beautiful home by just spreading rumor. The, the typical anonymous call in the middle of the night. You know what? I'm your husband's girlfriend. May Allah forgive us. These type of phone calls are the most dangerous. The, a believing woman would actually put the phone down and never ever believe someone who's anonymous. Not at all. Never. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. Vice versa as well. So Aisha radiallahu anha goes home. She cries to her mother, Umm Ruman, and she says, Oh my mother, you know, this is what's going on. The mother says, I know what's going on, but my daughter, take it easy. Hawini alayk. Take it easy. You're a very pretty girl. And you know what? You have a husband who really loves you. you you're bound to have jealous elements who are definitely going to say things. Look at the beautiful advice. Not like today. They would advise you, fix him, break the marriage, come back home. The house is open. <laughs> Typical advice of today. Look at the difference. Mother says, take it easy. You've got such a beautiful home. What a lovely husband. And people would be jealous. They would say things. They would definitely say things about you. Just take it easy. So she began to cry. And she, she says, oh my mom, what should we do about it? She says, you know what? Ask Allah, call out to Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open the doors. In the meantime, she began to cry. And she was crying. She says, I cried so much I had no tears left. And the Prophet ﷺ goes out to speak to some of his best companions. He speaks to Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, Oh Ali, you know what's happened? He says, yes, what should I do? Ali radiallahu anhu said, you know what? There are so many women out there. If you really want to know the truth, perhaps you can ask the maid, you know, the servant. The servant won't lie. Go and ask the servant if this woman is actually a chaste woman, you know, proper, modest, if she is straight. So they go to Barira radiallahu anha. They ask her and she has the best recommendations. She gives a reference for Aisha radiallahu anha. That is the purest of the pure. She says, this is an innocent woman. Absolutely innocent. She is dedicated to her spouse. In fact, she is dependent on what her spouse gives her and so on. So they heard that. The Prophet sallallahu asks Usama bin Zaid radiallahu anha. Oh Usama, you've heard what, what happened. What's your opinion? He says, I've only known your family to be pure, to be clean, to be the best, the most honorable. And I don't believe what has happened. What the people are saying. So the Prophet ﷺ then gets up on the mimbar. And he says, now he's visibly upset because now he knows that this is just a lie. But he says, who is going to excuse me regarding this man, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul? whose harm has reached my own home, we need to penalize him and punish him. So the people from Medina Munawwara, some of them said, yes, we will do this. And some of them said, we will do that and so on. But there was no decision made as to the punishment of that particular man, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, who started the rumor. And when this rumor had started, the people fell into three categories. 
One, the true believers, they said this is a lie. Completely. Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu was one of them whom when his wife said, did you hear what people are saying? He said, keep quiet. This is definitely a lie. It's clear fabrication. Would you ever do that? She said, no. Well then Aisha is better than you. Radiallahu anha. Subhanallah. Look at that. You wouldn't do it. So keep quiet. Aisha radiallahu anha is better than you. So the bulk of the believers, that was their reaction. They didn't entertain the rumor. We all should learn a lesson in our own lives. People spread rumor. Don't entertain it. Switch it off. Block the person. Why not? Put the phone down. Get up and walk out of the discussion. That's your witness on the day of judgment. Subhanallah. We are too shy. No, but those were all friends sitting there. They were just having fun. They were just uttering. Are you going to sit with them when they're burning in Jahannam? May Allah forgive us. May Allah not do that to us. The minimum you could do is get up and walk out. Stop it. Block it. Tell them this is wrong. I don't want to hear this. This was the true believers. They reacted in this way. Then there were some such as Mr. Ibn Athata and the lot. They just had fun. They, they enjoyed the juicy gossip. Just like people, you know. They call it panchat. Have you heard that? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. They enjoy this gossip, really. They want to carry the juicy tales and marinate it with the latest Indian spices. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Honestly. And we carry the tale from pillar to post. And we add and subtract as, we, as it suits us in order to make it sound so beautiful. And guess what? It's Ramadan and we are fasting. And it's the last 10 days and it's a Friday. But we're not worried. It's okay. But that's what everyone is saying. Everyone is saying. So you're just becoming a number with the rest of those who perhaps will be punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's be careful. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of this category of people as well who loved to spread that rumor. And then there was the one who created the tale. He was the biggest of the lot, the culprit, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. So Aisha radiallahu anha says, after one month, I was sitting with my folks, with my parents, and the Prophet sallallahu entered, and he addressed me officially and properly. He says, oh Aisha, you know what the people are saying? What has got to me is this and this and this regarding you. If you are... If you are innocent, Allah will reveal your innocence. And if you are guilty, ask Allah's forgiveness, Allah will forgive you. Look at this. He's saying to his wife, if you are guilty, ask Allah's forgiveness and return to him, and he will forgive you. He is indeed most forgiving. She says, I looked at my father and I said, oh my father, say something. Father says, I don't know what to say. Oh my mother, say something. Mother says, I don't know what to say. So she decided to speak. She says, I said, Wallahi, Allah knows I'm innocent. If I say I'm innocent, you are not going to believe me. And Allah knows I'm innocent. If I say I'm guilty, you will believe me, but I'm innocent. So she's saying, the only thing I can say is what the father of Yusuf alayhi salam said. What was that? Jamil. My patience is indeed beautiful. Allah is the one who will assist regarding what they are uttering against me. Regarding what they are describing. It is Allah who will help. And she says, as I am crying, the Prophet ﷺ had not yet moved. No one had moved. And Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam comes down to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam there and then with the following verse, verse number 11 of Surah An-Nur. Inna al-ladhina ja'u bil-ifki usbatum minkum la tahsabu sharran lakum bal huwa khayrun lakum likulli imri'in minhum maktasaba min al-ithm والذي تولى كبره منهم له عذاب عظيم. Those who have come with that fabrication, with the false accusation, they are a group from amongst you. The Prophet ﷺ says, "Abshiri ya Aisha." Good news to you, O Aisha. Allah has declared your innocence from seven heavens. Subhanallah. Allah has declared your innocence. And Aisha radiallahu anha was so, so delighted. She says, I didn't even move. My mother says, get up and give him a hug. He says, no. She says, no, I'm just thanking Allah. What has just happened now? She was sitting, thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
She says, I knew Allah would clear my name because I was absolutely innocent. But I didn't expect verses of the Quran to come down to be recited forever and ever. Subhanallah. So this was the status of Aisha radiallahu anha. And Allah says, they are indeed a group from amongst you, those who created the fabrication. Do not think it is bad for you. It was in fact good for you. That's a powerful lesson for us all. When negative comments are being uttered about you, it's very good for you. Maybe through that you achieve elevation. You wouldn't have had they not uttered all these bad words about you. When people have rumors, slander that they spread regarding any one of us, we should not think for a moment that Allah forgot us. That is our ticket to paradise. Perhaps all their good deeds will come to us if they have any. And if they don't, our evil goes to them. What better way of entering paradise could there have been? A little bit of patience regarding the dirty statements of people of this world. And we get paradise for free. So Allah says, it wasn't bad. It's good for you. And for everyone who has messed their mouths with that accusation shall be a portion of the punishment. And the one who created the tale, the head of the lot, will definitely be served a very, very great punishment by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this was the verse, or these were some of the beginning the verses, the next nine verses were also revealed at the same occasion. Inshallah, we will go through some of them tomorrow. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and lesson. Perhaps we will derive a few more lessons from the same story tomorrow. And inshallah, we hope to apply it in our own lives to become more conscious of our tongues and of what we say. And let's have good thoughts about others rather than having bad thoughts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah, bihamdihi, subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa. إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك